And all right. The floor is now yours. Take us away. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our senior design project presentation today. This semester, we were met with the task of designing a pipette system for a microbioreactor that we got to work on in mechanical design, too. Our team members include Gabriel, Beton, Oliver, Noah, Andrea, and myself, Tyler. So a quick overview of our final design. We featured a stepper motor driving a plunger within a pipette sleeve. Our pipette sleeve is actually consisting of two separate parts attached via threads. And I'll get into that a little bit more on the next slide. For our pipette ejection system, we utilize a dowel pin that feeds into a 3D printed ejection part. And this ejector follows the cylindrical portion within the pipette sleeve to basically lead up and down of that shaft. And this ensures um, no cross-contamination between pipettes and between different dispensing modes. And on the middle portion, we just wanted to show more clearly what the plunger looked like actually inside of the assembly and then our file assembly on the right-hand side. However, we did need to note that we did include some finger grooves on the external portion of the tool casing. And this is basic to ensure that the user is able to easily handle the whole assembly if it needs to be replaced within the system over time. So going through our design iterations, in the top left corner, you can see the 3D printed part that actually just inspired the rest of our design. Now, a couple of the issues that we ran into with this iteration was mainly DFM issues, more specifically the total length of that cylindrical portion given the internal radius with the existing drill bit sizes in the lab. But also we were hoping to weld the cylindrical face onto that machine square face and we were also met with some concerns about the ability to weld that properly. So we went back to the drawing board and decided to separate this portion into two separate parts. So we had our three printed base, which you can see in the middle, in the top right, in the top area, and that features internal threads, which will feed into our actual machine pipette itself, as seen right next to it. And on the furthest right-hand side, you can see how that actually connects into each other. For our pipette ejector for Rev1, the cylindrical extruded face that's actually on the bottom of the pipette ejector, we ran into some issues with just with the part being 3D printed. And when we were trying to assemble it over time, that part actually snapped off. So instead we removed that extruded portion and created a through hole and added a feature on the tool casing that you can see in the middle on the bottom area of the screen that would actually fit a dowel pin. So the dowel pin will be press fit into the tool casing and then the spring will actually be fed on top of the dowel pin. And we decided to choose the bottom portion of the tool casing for the dowel pin in case there was any expansion of the material during the heating process that we didn't have to be concerned about that whole portion falling out of our tool casing. And our last iteration for a pipette ejector was just expanding the internal radius because we did notice some issues with friction during ejection of the pipette tips. So just giving it more room and more freedom to move within the whole tool casing assembly itself. Next slide. So here we have uh, two videos. On the left is a demo of our pipette actually working. Uh, the TA Fran gave us a volume to meet, which was 465 microliters. And uh, we were able to meet that within the five microliter tolerance as will be shown in just a second. Um, go. And then on the right, we have our ejection. Uh, this was an idea that we came up just by using the commercial pipette. Um, and we essentially just copied uh, what they did within our, made it work within our own uh, system. Right, and I do wanna note also that the ejection method was we wanted to go with more of a passive motion rather than having to add another actuator. So the portion that you can see the hand clamping on the left side of that video is a piece that we plan to have mounted inside of the enclosure. So as the tool casing moved up on the translational system, pushing into the ejection bar that would feed that whole 
basically ejector down, pushing out the pipette sit. And so one of the most important design aspects of this pipette is the O-ring. Um, so the way we ended up designing our O-ring was using the Parker O-ring handbook, very useful. We had our design for our um, plunger and we started with that as a base. We went and we looked at the industrial reciprocating O-ring seals, which is um, the best table for our design application. Uh, we went to the table and we found a cylindrical dimension that was already close to what we had designed. Uh, we found that to be the O-ring size of 108 and then we followed all those dimensions on the table and uh, that's how we designed our system. It, it worked well and we actually had no issues with our O-ring le leaking at all. Uh, after finding that inner dimension of the cylinder, the diameter, we were able to ensure some other of our values, some other dimensions being like the height of the cylinder. So we used that diameter, calculated the necessary height that it needed to be in order to dispense the maximum volume, which was a thousand microliters. We found it to be around 10 millimeters and we uh, added a few more in height in order to uh, account for any uh, wiggle room. We were able to find the angle that was needed for the motor to turn. Um, and this is what we used in our Arduino code uh, as, as a starting point. As we'll see later, we had to deviate from that quite a bit. Um, and we also calculated steps, but finally we found the uh, microliter that we that dispensed per step given that uh, diameter. And we want to make sure that that was below the five microliter uh, dispensing accuracy that we need to meet. The calculation we did to support the validity of the design was approximating the lead screw as a cylindrical cantilever beam, and then taking into account the weight of uh, the, the sub-assembly that included the stepper motor, lead screw, 3D printed casing, and fasteners. We approximated that weight is 337 grams, and then set up a uh, bending moment e uh, equation to find the support reactions on either end. And then further, we were able to create shear and bending moment diagrams in order to calculate the maximum bending stress that would be uh, exhibited onto the lead screw, uh, even at uh, when passive and not operating. And we found that that would be well under the yielding stress for the material of the lead screw that was constituted as an alloy of stainless steel and brass. Luckily, failure analysis was done for the pipette ejector piece. The objective for this was to determine the critical load necessary to subject the beam to buckling. A uniform distribution load was assumed so central loading conditions could be used for simplicity. It was also assumed that once the ejector made contact with the pipette tip, both ends were fixed. So we get a constant of C equals four as seen here and determined from chapter four of Shigley's mecha mechanical engineering design textbook. All of the equations shown in the slide were taken from sections 412 and 413 in the Shigley textbook. Since the material used in our 3D printers is PETG, a yield strength of 28.3 megapascals and an elastic modulus of 1.1 gigapascals was used. Both of these values were taken as the minimum reported from MatWeb to account for a worst case scenario. Uh, the debarkation point was determined as 55.4, the radius of gyration is 25.4 millimeters and the slenderness ratio is 3.46. Since the slenderness, slenderness ratio was less than the de demarcation point, the pipette ejector beam was found to be a Johnson column rather than an oiler. And thus, the equation at the bottom is used to find the critical load. From this, we get a critical load of 2.14 kilonewtons, which is more than enough force necessary to remove the pipette tip. While determining which component of our design would most likely fail, for, fail first, the 3D printed portion of the shaft was analyzed to guarantee that shearing would not occur while, when placed under strain. To ensure that the PETG threadings could withstand the stresses from threading to the desired preload, the yield stress was used to determine the measurement for the tensile strength. This value was then used along with the area of the shaft to determine the maximum force placed that the plastic could be placed under. From there, the maximum torque of the shaft was found to be approximately six newton meters, which was much higher than the required torquing level. All right, so before we initiated any data collection with our pipette system, we decided to create a pipette calibration curve. And in doing this, it allowed us to input any microliter volume amount within our given range and output a certain motor angle that was then used to be inputted into our Arduino code that actually ran all the liquid collection and dispensing mechanisms with the correct tolerance. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, we also created an actual versus theoretical pipette calibration um, graph as well. 
This kind of just helped us visualize more um, how close our design reaches the actual values. Um, looking at this, we came to the conclusion that the more volume dispensed, the further it actually deviates from the theoretical value. And this led us to believe that a big portion of our inaccuracy um, was due to the lead screw, which is exactly why we created these two graphs. So for our validation testing, we chose four different volume amounts and had a sample size of 10 for each dispense. So we created a quick histogram of each data collection and fit a normal distribution curve. And from this data, we calculated what the 95th percentile would be. And I did want to point out that for the 700 microliters, that was a bit lower of a value that we were hoping for. But this is definitely something we believe we can correct and get much closer to the customer requirement need if we were to fit more points in our calibration calculation and get more consistent output from our actual dispensing mechanism. And so here is a pie chart describing our pipette system cost breakdown. Um, we decided to break it up into three subsections and they are manufacturing, materials, and OTS parts. As you can see, manufacturing contributes the least to our total cost of $85.66. Um, but to give you more of a percentage breakdown, manufacturing contributed 3.1%, while materials and OTS contributed 40.9% and 56% respectively. Here we have our customer need mapping. This kind of just describes um, how or why we you know, completed each of the customer needs successfully. So two that I wanna point out that I think are pretty important are our, vol our given volume range with our tolerance of plus or minus five microliters. Um, as you guys saw in the demo video and our validation data that was successfully completed. Um, as well, towards the bottom right, um, I like to point out our operational lifetime without human intervention um, was calculated to be approximately 1.6 years. And with this slide, just more customer needs mapping. One I would like to point out as well is our manual assembly time, which um, was supposed to be under the five minute interval, which came out to be one minute and 45 seconds, which was pretty quick. Thank you guys for attending our senior design final presentation. And now we would like to open the floor to any questions. Great job, guys. Thank you for uh, thank you for the presentation, going through everything with us. We'll go ahead and let our uh, let our panel here go and weigh in and ask any questions they might that they might have. Hey guys, this is Tom Singer from Northern Grumman. Um, the, uh, the finger grooves are an interesting touch, uh, but I'm, I'm not really sure they add much to your design. I mean, this isn't something that's really intended to be handled regularly. It, it's more of an ergonomic feature than a, uh, you know, we're not holding on to something that's going to be particularly slippery or slippery or, or anything I wouldn't expect. So, um, I, I think you cut those and, and simplify your design a little bit and, and maybe cut the cost a little bit as well. Um, I, I like the, the thought that, that you had there, but I'm, I'm not real sure that's, that's adding too much to your design. Um, the, uh, the ejector concerns me, right? I mean, so, so you've got something that's, that's way, way off axis. Um, and I, I, I appreciate you did a, a buckling analysis of that. Um, that, that is certainly one failure mode that I would expect there. Uh, I think that you, you did a column analysis for something that's, uh, essentially a, like on axis loading, right. And is that, is that correct? Did you consider eccentricity of load at all in that column analysis? Um, no, like in our um, experience with like ejecting the tip, we found that like there wasn't any, like it, it didn't seem like it was like um, any danger of like snapping or any of that. So we thought like um, a, a more simplified analysis was more than necessary to show that what was required to eject the tip was uh, not necessary. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would say for uh, for this kind of analysis, 
um, it, if you're going to do a buckling analysis, and, and again, I appreciate that you did do a buckling analysis, um, your your load is going to be you know way way off the axis of the column, and, and that's going to significantly affect your buckling analysis. It, it might not be to the point that it it impacts uh, your design. You might say, okay, this is still an acceptable design, but if you're going to do the analysis, definitely consider the uh, the eccentricity of the load there. Um, beyond that, just from a a design standpoint. Um, I, I hate to see sharp corners, right? So, so I'm looking at, at sharp corners in your design, um, and those are going to be stress concentrators. If even if they don't fail right away, they're going to uh, potentially be failure points long term. Especially, I would I would guess the uh, the one up at the top uh, where that's going to be uh, as as the thing bends, that's going to be put in attention. So I, I would be concerned there, especially. Um, so if you can just fill in some radii in there, that would that'd be helpful. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I do like, uh, by the way, uh, about the design that this is not, you don't have any sort of separate actuator on here, right? You're, you're taking advantage of capabilities that are already existing within the system uh, and, and using those as an ejection mechanism rather than, you know, designing a, you know, little solenoid to pop this thing off or, or something. So I, I appreciate the uh, the synergy you're taking advantage of there. Um, and I, I I did like the, uh, the, statist the statistical treatment of your dispensing accuracy. I don't think anybody else really did that. They just showed plots and they said, hey, all these points, they, they basically overlay each other and, and you can't see the difference between them, so it's good. Um, I, I appreciate that, that you guys have uh, a little more rigor to the uh, uh, to the analysis of, of how you're meeting that customer need there. Um, and I, I, I also appreciate that, you know, you've got the cloud of, of customer needs and how you're meeting them. Uh, but in that cloud, I did see a couple of, of no's and, and that was maybe surprising to me. Um, let's see. One is one on this slide, right? So you've got the uh, the dimensions. Are you are you not within the envelope? Or, or what? Man, what is that? Three. What is customer need number five here that you're showing? Those are just the dimensions of what um, the length, width, and height of our entire pipette system. Um, due to our design, it's got to be three point six three millimeters. So we were also a little bit thrown off by those measurements as well, which is why we didn't meet that. Um, did you Did you ask? Like, did didn't. you ask if that's a real requirement? We did not clarify. That's you should definitely clarify that. Yeah, three point six three millimeters. I would I would never tell somebody something has to be an eighth of an inch. That's, yeah. what, that's exactly what we I, I think that I think that's either a, a typo. Yeah, uh, three hundred and sixty-three is a because that's a little bit over a foot. Right. Yeah, I, I would much rather go to the customer and say, "Hey, is is there a, a typo here?" Than go to the customer and say, "Hey, we didn't meet your requirement." I, I think that would be greatly preferable. Um, let's see, and then I think on the on the next slide there was another no as well. Or was I saying? Oh, the uh, XYZ location of pipette tip to tool holder is within half a meter. And again, I mean, th this is a situation where it, it looks like you're blowing way, way past that. Uh, so maybe that is a situation of a misunderstood requirement. So if you want clarification on that customer need, that meant that it was repeatable to within half a millimeter. So, cause they, that means, so if you, if a, a 380, so how many of you guys took MEC2 last, in the last year before pre heliostat MEC2? So if you think diameter of a 384 well plate is roughly a millimeter and a half. So that was to say, if you're plus or minus half a millimeter, you're still gonna be inside That makes a lot oh. more sense. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that does make a lot more sense. But Tom, you are right. It's better to clarify than to assume. So yeah, for your feedback for sure. Mm -hmm. He's normally right. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So, do you have any other questions? 
I'll, I'll step back. I'll see if anybody else step has anything. Back. Rick, do you have any anything you'd like to chime in on here? Rick may not have audio. I think he, he mentioned me. He didn't have any. Oh. Yeah, I, he said he had to take a call. So he, oh, okay. so he's on yeah, he may not have audio on. Um, All right, cool. Well, in that case, maybe maybe I'll ask a few more. Um, so yeah. so one thing uh, that that we were talking about in the previous presentation uh, is interfaces, right? And and a lot of the challenge in engineering is around interfaces. Uh, so I, I'd really appreciate seeing you know more about how this interfaces with the various systems, right? So you've you've got physical connections and power connections to uh, you know to the overall microbio reactor. Uh, we talked about like positioning uh, tolerances for uh, for well uh, uh, positioning over wells. Um, you're going to have positioning tolerances to uh, eject a pipette and to physically come down onto something uh, to trigger that uh, ejection mechanism, or I guess come up into something to trigger that ejection mechanism. Um, there's going to be, you've got to pick up a, a new pipette, which means you're going to have, you know, that pipette is going to be sitting in some sort of holder and you're going to have to navigate over to it, uh, drop down on top of it. And, you know, you've got some positional tolerances in, in picking that up. Um, not to mention, you know, physical access to that sort of thing. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you've considered any of those and how they're impacting your design. Yeah, so talking about interfacing um, our pipette with like the XYZ motion, one thing we thought about doing at, towards the beginning of semester is shortening our lead screw because that kind of um, elongates our whole design by an unnecessary amount. Um, and so if we were to shorten that, that would give us more mo you know, more area that we could move around um, without like it running into things or, um, you know, just like more space essentially to work with. Um, but we were advised against shortening a lead screw um, because it then we could damage it. And we were, had already been able to make a design with it being a hundred millimeters, but it would have been nicer to shorten it to like 50 say, and that way you have um, something that's a little more, um, with more abilities to move around and you know move down into uh, the little cell culturing and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if anyone has anyone has anything else to add to that. But feel free. Yeah, I would say the biggest constraint with uh, the interfacing with us was definitely the height dimension, and so we had a lot of considerations with the design that would incorporate more uh, motion in that y direction, but. Uh, just considering the constraint of the uh, enclosure that we created in the lab, we tried to be as considerate as possible with the internal motion of the pipette ejector to try and make sure that all of the motion was contained within the internal structure, which obviously can't be perfect, but to make it as similar to the uh, existing given pipette that we had been given at the beginning of the semester. Yeah. Did, does, some, does something already exist for your uh, your ejection? mechanism trigger? Do, do you have something in the system that you're you're planning on pressing on to actuate that? Or is that another piece of the design that's going to have to be fit in there? What's, what's the status on that? So we did notice some existing hole patterns on the inside of the enclosure. So that piece would be something that's added. Uh, more specifically, we're thinking next to where the assembly is actually clipped on after the translational system, something within that vicinity. But we figured that just adding a basic four hole square pattern within the enclosure is something that we could definitely do and just focus more so again on that passive ejection, not having to focus on another actuator. Who's responsible for designing that and accounting for it in the overall design of the bioreactor? I would put that on the pipette team. Um, that's something that we would definitely have to talk with enclosure about. But again, that's interfacing with our actual ejection bar. So that's something that we would have to definitely design. But I mean, we have something to show for this moment in that uh, short video clip, but to actually ensure that that does interface well and not affect anything with the enclosure team is definitely something we would have to meet about. There you go, yeah. I will say, 
that it's a uh, it's a pretty cool idea to have it be external and use like X Y Z motion and something fixed above, say, a biohazard trash container inside of the enclosure to be what ejects it. So it is a nice. I think you guys are the only group group that I saw at least. We've only got one or two pipettes left. You're the only ones to have some externally actuated ejecting mechanism. So there was one that had that little like seesaw mechanism underneath, which was a similar idea. Oh well, yeah. That it, right, it was like, right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you're the second group to do it. Two out of eighteen ain't bad. Awesome. Like to hear it. And it looks, I just saw the chat, just saw the chat, it looks like you, you made, you made Tom pretty happy by including shear and bending moment diagrams. I, oh man, I love that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not even going to go back and, and check whether they're any good or not. I, I just love seeing them. <laughs> so, so I, I think uh, we'll go ahead and end on that note. Um, we'll go ahead and stop recording here. Um,